Welcome to another episode of Dinner and Lola. We have a great show for you tonight. We've got some very fine creators and artists that I'm really excited to talk to. We have the wonderful Krista Vernoff. And we can all clap. We have the lovely and glorious Paul Rust. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have the bold and the beautiful Crystal Chappelle. And we have the pretty and pregnant Emma Caulfield. Thanks. Now, here's a little sort of dinner at Lola trivia. You met the guy that did that to you yes. here. I did. Right? I was sitting with someone else who knew him. He came over, Mark came over, and I was like, yep, that's, that's, it's that's on. It's on. And he's tall, too. Yes. He's a tall Brit. He's a tall Brit, 6'3". Um, and I'm falling you know, in love with this guy. He's very, he's, <laughs> he's very cute. Um, and he's an actor as well. He, he is. Is it important to date somebody who really knows what you do? Because I feel like as artists, you know, actors and writers and creators, it's a big part of us, this industry. Or do you want the complete opposite? I never wanted to be with an actor, ever. Really? No. Like, that was my top on my list. Like, absolutely 100% not an actor. Wow. So I blew that one. I think it's important to date somebody who understands what you do, but ideally is not in competition with you. Yes. Uh. So I, I've been with people who were writers, and that didn't work out right. My oh, boyfriend wow. now went to film school, but is not in our industry. Uh -huh. So he just changed careers, and now he has a career in tech. But he very, he understands all aspects of what I do, and that's uh, it, it's perfect. It's, it's really it's helpful. Now you're married, though. Yes, I am. Is, is your husband in the industry at all? He's an actor. Check that out. Yeah, yeah. But now he's a contractor because now he's older and mm -hmm. is not acting anymore. We're built more flipping houses. So my wife is a Leslie is a writer, and uh, we um, we work together. So maybe that's the well, the solution if you're both in the same careers as you. Oh. You join forces. So that's, that's what really we did good. together. Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. guys physically write together? No, we're, uh, I, usually it's like passing stuff back and forth. She would write something and then I would read it and just give my thoughts on it and I would write something and she'd give her thoughts on it. So that was the beginnings of it. But um, uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a romantic. It's a, it's, it's a it's romantic thing to work together. Yeah. Cut to you guys just in the bedroom, just <laughs> pink Typing. pages. Yeah, just, <laughs> interior bedroom, <laughs> she sleeps alone. <laughs> What I find really fascinating is that I've seen your show and uh -huh. your wife is writing scenes for you to go f the most beautiful women I've seen. Uh, I know, that's like, crazy. How is that? Yeah. <laughs> well played. Wow. She, no, she's usually the one who uh, is pushing that. So yeah, it's wow. not me. It's not me. But uh, <laughs> she'll like, uh, yeah, when she'll, you know, if she's on set during like a, uh, an intimate scene and stuff, She's the person who's most cool with it. Like yes, us so actors, you know, we're like uncomfortable or it's awkward and we're shy and embarrassed, but she's like totally cool with it. Yeah. She's like, could you just move your hand slightly up the camera? <laughs> yeah, she's like, yeah. tell Paul to grab her ass. <laughs> God damn it. Well, now when we're together at home, we have like a first AD there who's guiding things. And that <laughs> Got the yeah, like, what? Oh, okay, yeah. Move could you hand. could you watch Mark do a sex scene? No. No? No, I've already decided no. <laughs> not not <laughs> happening. No, Big okay. movie, Oscar contender, Mark lead, sex scene, Charlie Theron. Can you watch it? Oh god, it should just be Charlie Theron? I'm just <laughs> I'm really proud of this work. <laughs> <laughs> then yeah, I, I guess. I just figure like it's just let it be. I don't. I, don't, I, can't, I can't. I just do don't it. need it. I just yeah. don't. It's cool. I, I I don't want. So here's okay. Here's what I want to talk about. Because you guys are all actors, but you guys are all write as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to get into how you transitioned from acting into writing. Period. <laughs> right. It looks amazing. <laughs> it is good. What is it? other than just necessity that makes someone go from being an actor to a writer and Crystal you created another show as a spin-off off of Guiding Light, oh, Guiding Light. Venice. Sure um, uh, I was uh, on Guiding Light for 10 years but before we went off the air uh, 
they decided to take my character and, and put me in a, a relationship with another woman. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a really good soapy story, right? Uh -huh. Well, it's, a, it's a soapy story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my character was dying of uh, cardiomyopathy, heart disease. And um, she fell in love with this guy, but he happened to be married. So she just wanted to get married one last time. Because that's what soap characters do. <laughs> and, and he dies in a motorcycle accident. So she ends up with his heart, of course. Mm. Wakes up. Yes, wakes ah. up. And the widow comes in. And, uh, and so slowly over a year, they started to put these two women together. They just fell in love. They were raising children together. They just, oh, wow. it, was a really, it was a really huh. beautifully told story mm. for broadcast uh, yeah. for television, except they wouldn't let us kiss. Hmm. Not even a kiss on the cheek. Wow. Not even a kiss on the hand. So I just said, let's take it to the web, um, produce it for the web. Uh, so oh, cool. I wrote it with a friend and we got started in 2009 and we funded everything through the fans because at that time oh, wow. YouTube was really kicking in, right? Mm -hmm. It's 2009. So we started a subscription based model. Um, that fan and the recession was hitting, so we ended up with a, you know, you could gift a friend. So we really bonded the community together, but it was all over the world. It was like global. Like they asked us to be on CNN International. Oh, wow. We were in the couple of New York Times arts and culture section. This love story that mm. happened on Guiding Light that was now moving over to the web. I'm sorry, the writers and the creators of Guiding Light sort of gave you creative... We or, took or... and changed the character names. It belongs oh. to somebody else. Oh, no. but, it, but it really was a, It was the fans who did it. They're the ones who stepped up and shared their stories with mm -hmm. me. and. You know, a lot of hard stories to hear, and mm. you know, but they stepped up. And, and it says a lot about uh, that uh, an audience would be more excited and open minded to something as opposed to the people, con the network controlling it, right? Like, right, right. because you yeah. were telling, because you gave yourselves permission mm. to kiss and tell the real. In, in Venice, yes, we did. We, the first 10 seconds of season one, these two <laughs> are kissing. Good. That's, yes. awesome. well, that's a good point, too, because yeah. I feel like. A lot of times we run into notes and networks and studio execs who are like, this isn't what people want to see. Well, the note's really about this isn't what the advertisers want to pay for people to see. Right. It's, it's never no. really about what people want to see. It's about we're afraid we're going to lose our advertisers because people in the red states right. don't want to see that. How come they just don't say that then? We, yeah, we're advertise. afraid. Pretty much every note is we're afraid. I, and that's not fair. There are really great creative execs who give you really smart notes. But when it's that kind of you, although you're in love, can't kiss, it's just a, that's about fear. Yeah. How do you go from UCB to Inglorious Bastards? And we'll uh, get to love in a second. Yeah. No, the, uh, I think um, Inglorious Bastards came out of... Uh, I uh, auditioned uh, for uh, for the movie, and uh, I was brought in as a oh, um, uh, Quentin Tarantino doesn't uh, if he wrote scenes for every character, the movie would be double its size. So he's just going to bring in some actors who are like improv actors, and when we're on the scene, you'll throw out stuff, and I'm like. Uh, <laughs> Oh, the like century's greatest dialogue writer is like I have to like improvise something on the level of like uh, that he would actually write. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Royal the it. cheese. Wow. Yeah, improvise the Royal <laughs> cheese speech. You yeah, know? you can do it. <laughs> In the audition, it was you have a look that we're going for, and uh, so just to keep your mouth shut and your face will do the work, you know, sort of thing. Uh, you will get paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, it's probably like all things, which is just like people, if they just enjoy your vibe or whatever, it's like, ah, this person will be fine to have on set and it'll be okay, so. So then love, love yeah. is sort of a big deal. How'd you get Judd Apatow? No, that was um, uh, uh, an actress on Love, uh, Charlene Yee. Mm -hmm. uh, she um, was originally in Knocked Up, and uh, she was nice enough to ask me if I'd want to help co-write it with her, and so that was how I initially met Judd. And then after that, I was just like doing, like um, I guess, consulting stuff. I was just like reading scripts and giving thoughts, and then organically, this kind of idea about a, a, a show about a relationship that... Mm. I think he thought me and uh, and Leslie, my wife, uh, she was writing on girls, and so he knew of Leslie, and then he knew of me separately, and then I think he just was vibing on what our relationship was, and I think Judd had similar experiences or similar, you know, um, 
previous relationships that matched ours that he thought was interesting territory. Yeah. He's a, a great collaborator. And I think, you know, in this sort of actor-writer conversation, he came up as a writer, mm -hmm. so he has a lot of respect for the writer and wants to collaborate with somebody. When you write something, you create something, it's very difficult if you put it out and it's not received uh -huh. the way you want to put it out. Or you, the way you want it to be received. Uh, it just feels like a very, like a punch to the gut. Yeah. Yes. Because mm -hmm. even, well, Emma and I worked on a show that, you know, Bandwagon, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great show. I kind of had a smaller role in it. It's I was all I've seen, though. The, the idea of Bandwagon was that celebrities are douchebags. And, you know, well, basically, not totally, <laughs> but you know, we we've all known enough of them right. to to make a composite um, <laughs> of someone. You know, do you know what I mean? Conclusion. Um, <clears throat> so Carrie, uh, who I'd been friends with for a few years at that point, um, she she's done this character named Tubi um, since she was a kid, and Tubi is questionable, like maybe autistic, maybe not. Like mm -hmm. you don't know, but she's always very always very astute with her observations, but she never looks you in the eye, and she says really inappropriate things, and quest you, you find yourself in that position, which we explored in that film, like, well, am I okay to laugh at this? Right. Because you don't really right. know what you're saying, so, mm -hmm. like, you know, everyone around me was like, you know, you A, the subject matter alone. Sure. Like, you can't even go near that. Like, sure. you, you would be hated. So we're like, well, forget it. That only fueled me more. I'm like, oh, well, we're gonna do it then. We're absolutely going forward with this, 100%. So we, we did it. We put together this strange film. Um, we took it to festivals, won an award. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, no one would touch it. No one. We're like, it's, for, it's hysterical, but we won't go anywhere near this with the 10-foot pole. And so to, to put that out there, to have a way of doing that, which was you know, short-lived, whatever, but it was, it was nice to be able to, to do yeah. that, because you yeah. don't really get much of an opportunity as an actor. You do what other people want you sure. to do, so it's nice to... It's your own expression. Your own expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to have it be something that's not, you know, safe is right. nice. Just put it out. Like, just mm -hmm. do the work. But I want to ask you about... See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this way. Because you, you right. worked on Grey's Anatomy for a very long time. How did you go from Grey's Anatomy's Grey's Anatomy. From there to here. How did I how did you go from running the biggest show in the world to making movies in your <laughs> No, but I have a, That's I have a strange I have a legit like question about that. When I came to Grey's Anatomy, I was a supervising producer in television. So I'd been in TV seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. I'd written on Wonder Falls and Charmed and a few other shows. And uh, and and then I came to Grey's Anatomy and I could write nine pages a day. Which is a lot. Yeah. It's, a lot. it's yeah. a lot, and I had sort of worked those muscles. And by the time I left Grey's Anatomy, I could write 39 pages wow. a day. What? Wow. Because you're doing 22 episodes a year, and in the early years, you don't have a staff yet that can write the show, or right. some of them can write it, or Shonda's pulling. Shonda's having an idea in the middle of the night, or I'm having an idea in the middle of the night, and it's pulling a thread. And even though the writers could write the show, now their their episode shoots in two days, and we just it up. We just pulled it apart. And so I've got to put it in my computer and um, there's just a huge amount. It, it was yeah. a huge wow. amount. I gained like 25 pounds in the first two seasons of that show because I just sat in my chair 16 hours a day and wrote. Like no amount of work makes me feel employed after Grey's Anatomy. I'm always like, I'm unemployed. I'm writing two pilots and working on Chainless. But I, but what I made Divorce and Stars because I, I have since leaving Grey's Anatomy made made written seven and made five network pilots that didn't go to series mm -hmm. and the disappointment of that the the high highs of this business and the low lows and the feeling of powerlessness and the feeling of like I've done everything I can I've done my job and this is really good and it's not going to go because mm -hmm. this human being doesn't like a thing that right. I you know, or mm -hmm. or this test audience doesn't understand this character or all of the things that are out of your hands and you're gonna go crazy. You're gonna go crazy in this town even though they're paying you the big bucks. Mm -hmm. And so I had learned from when I was writing on Charmed and I was feeling that uh, how are we gonna get the girls naked this week became the question and I started to hate the job. Mm -hmm. I wrote a play and that was where my joy came from. And mm -hmm. then that play launched my career at, sort of off the CW and into uh, other shows. And so when my pilot didn't go, on Fox last year, I 
sat down and I wrote a short film. I had never tried directing. They came and they worked in my living room and I made this little short, this little seven minute short. And That's I dope. loved it and I, I loved it and I wrote all the checks for it so nobody could give me any <laughs> notes. Because cool. even when you're a showrunner and that's your title, you're still like middle management and all these people have to approve. Right. So I wrote, Studio, I wrote, a, a, I wrote about uh, my divorce, and I had not had an avenue really. After a lot of years of, of doing a lot of television with a lot of people with a lot of opinions, a lot of notes, whatever, just just to have the freedom of like, this is what I wrote. This, this is, is how I imagined it. Yeah. This is, and I'm actually gonna make it look exactly how I imagined it. Nobody got to give me any notes except for the people who I asked for notes. Sure. Are you heavily noted or does, does Judd, does Netflix, how is it working with Netflix? Are they like just do your thing or do they have a lot of input? Um, they give as much support as possible without uh, many notes. They have great taste. So sure. uh, when they do have input, it's, it's amazing and uh, it's never like uh, unsolicited or whatever. Got it. But Thank yeah, you. the thing that has been surprising to me, just like after people watch the show is, um, oh, it's sort of what you were referencing, like, oh, I watched it and, and it was really uncomfortable and I didn't want to watch it. Or it was like cringy that never crossed our minds. We never ever talked about things being uncomfortable. This sort of sentiment of the show is like there's no bad guys. I wish I myself hadn't done that. It's rarely ever like somebody else in your universe is doing something bad to you. It's usually mm -hmm. you're doing all the bad stuff yourself. But you know, I, I, it's, true. I, I, uh, it's interesting because I've only worked in comedy rooms. Mm -hmm. And so like you can kind of understand if something's working because everybody in the room is laughing. And I've wondered before like, oh, do people, when they're working on a drama in the writer's room, are people like, getting choked up. <laughs> and like, you can't drop yeah. in emotionally to the story. Yeah. Yeah. But I did, there was one episode that I was writing where I came out of my office sobbing and screamed uh -huh. at Shonda that I was quitting if she made me kill the baby. Was it a little I came baby? out, so I came into the writer's room sobbing. It was a storyline where a father had to hold his daughter while she died. And I had a daughter that age at that time. Oh, and I yeah. was like, Almost, I was crying so hard over my computer. I felt like I was like Diane Keaton in one of those Nancy <laughs> Meyer movies. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I came out, I was like, I can't. She has to live. You go there, but not usually in the writer's room. Yeah. Usually oh. in the writing of it. You right. have to That's feel it. That's kind of great. Because there's a saying, when you write, we end up writing too much. And it's like, as writers, you, you love everything. That, or you should probably love everything you write. Do, would you want it all at one time? Would you want it weekly? It would I, depend. I yeah. do the weekly thing. I do an episode a week. It's every Wednesday at noon mm -hmm. Pacific time. So it, it airs around the world at different times. But what that does is it brings everyone to the water cooler. There's something about, you know, leaving them with that cliffhanger and, and they have to come back the next week. Mm -hmm. You write it differently depending mm -hmm. on if it's streaming or if it's mm -hmm. episodic. Did you find that with, with Love? That you wrote it differently? It was, you know, we were sort of editing it like as if it was a week to week show initially. Yeah. And so to watch them one through 10, it was a nail-biting experience uh, initially. It was like, oh, I hope this like uh, works, you know. But do you direct? Have you directed an episode? No, 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 no. Do yeah. you want to? Uh, no, I, mean, I, I can mean, call Judd. And be uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, we had uh, some really uh, uh, great directors, and we have. Who's the worst director you worked with this season? <laughs> do you direct? Uh, not yet. I no. Will. Yeah. Who's the best director? Good for you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I directed Stars because I read the statistics on women directing in Hollywood, and I was like, well, now I have to. Yeah. Now I have to. Because it's not okay. No. It's no, not okay. Not. Yeah. yeah. i tell you, though, not not like a crush sexually, but like a geek, a geek moment, because I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. Jonathan Frakes, he was directing the episode, yes. and I, um, I wasn't going to say anything. I was like, hey, nice to meet you, whatever. But then he opened the door and he's like, ah, I'm a coffee. I was like, big fan. I'm like, oh, uh, I love you. Oh, and I had to say, I was like, I just, need, I just need like a few minutes to just geek Star Trek out. I'm sorry. I know it's like years ago. And we had that whole little moment. And then I was cool. Okay. And then I kept it, even though I desperately wanted to ask like a million questions. Sure. I mean, total fan. But it's, it's kind of cool when you see somebody who really actually appreciates yeah. what it is that you created yeah. or you do. I was at a, yeah. an ATM recently and I was getting money out and this like total bro dude like came up to me and he fist bumped me and he was like, dude, thanks for the vulnerability. <laughs> <laughs> Which was That's a very special good. moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you guys feel when people say you made it? No one said what? that. It. 
No, no, does not, any artist feel that way? I don't think really? any artist feels that way. Feel like way. they've done it? Like they're they're where they want to be? I don't know. No, but there Sense are people who say it. I mean, that I don't think any of us ever feel like we, I, I feel like we all feel largely fraudulent at all times. I feel like the people who, who get in really into like, I've made it, that their careers are often short-lived. It's like an ego notion. I feel like the fraudulent, that feeling of like, I'm a fraud, and or if you want to take the negativity off it, that feeling of like, there's more I want to do. Right. Mm. There's more I want to mm. do. I want to try this thing now. And then you look at like what David Bowie was doing and right. and 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 what Prince was doing mm. and and how much and look at what Lin Manuel Miranda right. is doing right now. He's like the Same. biggest thing in the yeah. world, and he's still doing more. He's trying new things. Yeah. What's he, what he's always talking about? What he's going to do next? I don't know him. I'm obsessed with him on Twitter. I'm yeah. obsessed with that he's show. Here. I he's could do him. the whole musical for you right now. I'm obsessed <laughs> with him. But Prove that's it. It, what? Prove it. No. I know. Happens, no. <laughs> no. Okay. How does a bastard no. orphan <laughs> son of a whore and a Scotsman? Oh, yeah. Listen to it. All I do is listen to it, and and I'm. I love the fake out. No, I I love him. (laughs) I just want. I just want to look up to artists who continue to aspire to do more. We're out of time, unfortunately. But I know. But I have gifts for you. What? So the Peg Effect is one of our sponsors. Uh, These goodie bags. There's one month supply of necessities in this bag. And their motto is to empower through the cycle of giving. So you can give, we've been giving a lot, you can give back. Everyone gets one, and you can buy them, and you can support it at payeffect.org. That's it. That's Dinner at Lola. So thank you guys. Hey, that was fun. Thank you so much. Dinner at Lola. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I just put my hand in.